I had the chance recently to go to London with my wife and watch the press premiere in the UK for Dune Part 2. And I left it a few days so that it could stew in my mind. And also, I wanted to bring something slightly different to all those reviews that are out there before you decide to go and watch Dune Part 2. Now, if you're on board with Part 1, you're probably on board with Part 2. And you, you want to hear a non-spoiler review if you're here at all, so nothing is spoiled. Don't worry, I'm not going to do that. But for this, to make it informative, something a little bit more fun, I'm going to do the top five performances that I found, obviously, as a personal opinion. I spoke with my wife. She gave her opinions to me, and I collaborated that in my head. With that I took those informations. And then I've come with what I think is the most powerful performances, the top five. I'm going to rank them from five to one and also do a review in between. So I hope you find this good. Let's jump into some sandy, sandy world escapism. Dune part two. Paul Atreides unites with Chani and the Fremen while seeking revenge against the conspirators who have destroyed his family. So make sure your bladder is empty when you go to the cinema because unlike a press screening you will only have to watch the two hours and 45 minutes but with this you will have a half an hour at least added on with ads and so if you thought it was long if you've ever been into a long epic that is two hours and 45 minutes long and that ends up being three and a half hours or a lord of the rings thing you're gonna be busting so unless you are willing to pee into your drink you're gonna want to go before that's the top tip so when it comes to what your expectations will be is obviously you want it to be more of the same of part one to connect really well because it's been a while we've had a couple of years now we've been waiting i think three years and we've been waiting to have the conclusion to the story the best thing i can say about this film is it really does feel like it's the same you know like we haven't waited any amount of time the characters get right back into it and really the story is the growth characters that's what we expect to see our characters to become the leaders they need to be to become the people who they need to be to get revenge or free their land and that's what we get we get characters here that have been honed and grown with it whatever with whatever perspective family they're in to be the thing they need to be either the ultimate warrior killer or the one that carries a prophecy that is what we get here so in amongst the of course amazing visuals that we get again if you thought big was big or scale this director has this amazing ability to do scale to show scale like you believe you are there you believe these things are tangible but also just so big you can't really fathom it but the way the screen shows it that's what you get in here but doubled down and if you were hoping to see loads more worm action, yeah, you're going to get those shots that you probably remember reading from the books or from the original film. You're probably going to see that, but add more. And when I say probably, you definitely will. But in your mind, like how much of a conversion between Lord of the Rings when you saw the films, did it actually end up being the truth? And for me, I thought this was exactly what I was expecting it to be and more. I will say if you were affected with loudness, uh, my wife had to put her fingers in her ears for a while because there are moments when the score is so epic that the seats and the surrounding sound reverberated this the chairs literally shook i thought that was excellent my wife didn't enjoy all of that part but the escapism and the joy that you get from experiencing the conclusion of part two is exactly what i wanted it's a perfect combination of adventure escapism but also deep story that's rich from the book that has a true adaptation or at least the best adaptation we've had so far and nothing compares to this so far in those adaptations. I think I like the original. I think it was good for its time. But this is a spectacular part two. I do have one gripe. And where the first one left us off on a massive cliffhanger and it ended just at the place where it felt like the story was just getting going. This film ends like that as well. Meaning that they're kind of hoping they're going to get greenlit for the Messiah. But we don't know that yet it hasn't been greenlit just yet which is annoying because uh, it feels undone it feels unfinished so we get to a big sort of revenge plot with our main characters we see the big battles the fight scenes the epicness the scale the score everything that you want from this movie what you want it to be it is that nothing lets it down performances which we're going to talk about in a second 
all great. Nothing is uh, not as good, if not better, in this part. However, that ending left me going, ah, oh, this was such a hype, and the battle sequences wasn't an anticlimax, but when we get to those last few seconds even, I was left with, oh, really, is that how it ends? I don't remember it ending like that before. And so that just made me a little bit, oh, took a little bit of a way of that, the, the awesomeness. I definitely want to go and watch it again to experience it again. So that tells you something. When it comes out on the 1st of March, I think I will take myself along and just go and watch it again and, and, and enjoy it for all it is. Seeing it at the cinema with as many people as possible that want to be there. I saw it with 800 press people and everybody. You could feel the enjoyment, the tangibleness of it. The one thing I was surprised by, especially when it comes to British people is how much kind of laughing there was because there was a a character that carried weight with presence in comedic timing not through jokes but just through responses and i'll talk about that in a second but that's one thing that surprised me about this because there is a lot of darkness and depression and the story is quite moody you know there's a lot of forlorn looks and the battles are depressing and there's characters that you love that are you know not going to survive in amongst that, there's a, a levity that's brought through some of that comedic timing, which I loved and I thought was executed perfectly. So I will give this four and a half Nicolas Cage's out of five, pushing a close five. <laughs> you got one. Just for that ending, left me going, oh, really? Because the Messiah is probably at least four to five years away. Unfortunately, that's probably accurate. Let's talk about my five top favorite performances and I'll give you reasons why. So starting that. Number five is Zendaya, who plays Chani. I like the little bit that we got her in part one. We obviously get a lot more. She has the relationship to work on in this storyline, the sort of growing relationship that was hinted with Paul Atreus at, in part one. And so now, obviously, that comes into development. With what she has with Timothy Chalamet's character, I think she does a good job. Um, I really thought her performances with the uh, acting as well. I don't know how much of that was stunt person, but when she does the, the fighting sequences, it looked real, it looked like she could handle herself. And for the times when I could definitely tell it was her and not like a stunt double, I thought she was excellent and really carried herself in an amazing way. I just don't feel like she had a lot of dialogue of a lot of places to, to play with the character that she was given. When she was acting against Javier Bardem, now that was spectacular. Really enjoyed those moments. So for me, she kind of sits there at the at number five in the top five performances that we had in June part two. In number four, and so Rebecca Ferguson's character uh, sits there nicely. We saw a very motherly character from her in part one. This time around, it's who she is spiritually, without doing any spoilers, who she is spiritually carries a lot of weight in her performance this time around, more so than it did in part one. And with costume and makeup design, she really carries a presence whenever you see her. You don't necessarily like her as a character. She is a little bit different. There's a presence that's, that that was growing from part one to being in part two that I thought was excellent. But Rebecca Ferguson, in whatever she is in, whether it's a Mission Impossible movie, an action movie, a drama, she is always formidable. A beautiful, stunning woman, obviously, but her performance is fantastic. Number three, I would put, and this is really tough for me, this one, but Javier Bardem, who plays Stilgar, I was surprised at how much I enjoyed his performance in this. He is the guy that is absolutely 100% in the belief that Paul Atreides is the one that's spoken of in the prophecy and is going to take them to greener pastures. The Fremen are going to be led by Paul. And when we see Paul do something that validates the prophecy he is so excited and so like hyping up everybody that it's often comedic not like slapstick but just funny because he has this these looks in his facial expressions that when he's looking at another character who doesn't quite believe whether it's Zendaya or Paul himself he's just 100% in the belief and trying to bring them that into that and that is the funny moments he's 
moments that do that are adding weight to his character that's such a nice little extra that i wasn't expecting from him so he carries weight in the first one he carried great weight but there is this shift in his character i don't know it was necessarily meant to be funny but certainly in my press screening people did find it funny and but in a really good way so that's why i placed him at number three almost teetering that number two but number two i have a interesting unique battle between one and two but i have to stick with my two as is because fade rotha who is played by austin butler i think because he plays the the villain warrior he has in writing and in storytelling he has a lot of space to play with a character that is very violent a little bit narcissistic bit mentally broken but also exceptionally intelligent but ruthless uh, i think ruthless would be the, the word to play with so as an actor austin had a lot in his toy box of acting to play with which is why i didn't place him at number one because honestly on screen he's spectacular with the color palette and the design of the character that they've given him i actually forgot it was austin butler playing until like a big way into the movie and i was like oh my gosh that's austin butler and i was like that's the dude that played elvis and that's the dude that i was like in uh the, the apple series and i was like wow he really just plonked himself into that carry and disappeared into that role and when you forget the actor who's playing that if you know them and seen them in many other roles then you know they're doing a fantastic job so that's the reason why i've placed them number two the reason why i didn't place him at number one because timothy chamele has a a harder character or a harder character to progress to so where he was more understated in part one learning from his peers from uh, the warriors from his father from those that are really strong leaders in him he now has to become a leader not just for his house and for revenge but for the fremen people and taking that on board the battle that he has between the love relationship and carrying the responsibility of being a leader and whether that prophecy is real or not what it means to the people and also the revenge story what he has to do and what he has to put aside occasionally like what is the balance between that the battle is showcased through his acting and the different tier of presence i didn't know whether he he would be able to carry that leadership role and look authentic in it and he absolutely nails it i thought he was fantastic in those moments it was so fun to see him play that you know wonka i thought he was fine in and, and like the roles he plays in i know lots of people think he's this brilliant actor and i wasn't on board with that i think it's fine it's just not really someone i got yeah i'm definitely gonna watch that because timothy chamele isn't now i pay attention uh because i thought well and that i think speaks a lot not just to the actors and their performances but what the director is able to bring out of the character so denis uh, uh villeneuve is, is however you pronounce his surname i know it's denis he has captured our imaginations and showcased what we want to see vibrantly massively the cinematography this that every shot is an artwork and yet it's still so exciting you can get a pretentious artwork that you know every shot is artwork just for the sake of it but here it has purpose it's 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 there for every reason you can think of when it comes to storytelling and pushing the story forward and yet he's also taken time to bring out the best of our actors so you know it's the reason why he's in my top five directors living right now uh if not the top two top three let me know what you thought of part two when you've seen it how many times are you going to watch it at the cinema as a whole now part one and two i think is spectacular uh as a separate just part two i think it's great but I think it works better with part one and two. Obviously, that's why it's called part one and two, as the story is now complete, almost. Can't wait to hear your thoughts down below. Once you've seen it, let me know who were your top five performances. Thanks so much for watching, but most of all, until next time, remember, live long on Tuesday.